Uh, so here in chapter number five, Imam Ibn Balban, rahimahullah ta'ala, in discussing prophethood and leadership, he begins and he says, it is conceivable that Allah the Most High could favor his servants by sending them messengers. So basically here, it is conceivable, the Imam uses the words, uh, which literally mean lawful or permitted. But here we're talking about um, what is rationally permitted or rationally conceivable, that which is logical. And we've talked about throughout this text things from not only a legal Islamic perspective, but the Imam has incorporated things which deal with rationale uh, and in basically being intelligible, being rational, being logical, because, you know, at some point the Muslims, uh, they entered into this philosophical debate about doctrine, belief in God, belief in revelation, belief in hereafter, but all of the doctrinal issues that we ascribe to because uh, as the Muslim Ummah began to spread and to grow, came into contact with philosophy. And those philosophies um, had an impact on the way the Muslims began to believe in their faith. And so what happened for many of the theologians, if you will, or the great Imams, they would enter into this philosophical debate in order to defend the faith and convert those that had kind of given way to uh, foreign ideology. Sometimes it went over very well. Sometimes it, um, you know, it, it became difficult to discern between one and the other. However, um, this particular <coughs> imam and those of his caliber and like, um, they used the Quran and Sunnah as the basis of their debate, but they incorporated the language, if you will, in the terms of the philosophers in order to kind of, you know, have a discourse and um, use that to define, if you will, some of the beliefs. So that's why we have this, rationally speaking. It's conceivable. Of course, we know that led in the legislation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about sending messengers. He sends messengers to mankind. He also says some are more virtuous uh, than others. Meaning we believe in prophets and messengers. Some of them are ranked higher than others. And this has been explicitly mentioned in the Quran. It's been explicitly mentioned. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that these are the messengers. Some of them have been ranked higher or more virtuous than others. And the hadith, and there are hadith that seemingly prohibit the distinction of virtue between the prophets. The prophet والسلام, himself said, do not distinguish or do not rank in virtue the prophets one against the other. So you have what would be a, an apparent contradiction. However, um, before ruling out one thing as being abrogated and another not, you have to try and reconcile between these type, types of um, what would be considered obvious or apparent contradictions. And so one of the great Imams of Bahuti Rahimullah Ta'ala, he says that in responding to this, can the prophets be ranked or seen or believed in as some more virtuous than others? He says that what's intended uh, when the Prophet ﷺ prevented or prohibited us from ranking the prophets in level of their virtuousness, if you will, is that it doesn't lead to a reduction in any given prophet's level of virtue. Meaning that they are all virtuous, some over the other, and by ranking one above the other, it does not diminish or detract from those that are lesser, if you will, in virtue. So they all have virtue and are all, um, of course, we don't distinguish between believing in one or not, However, the Prophet ﷺ, as we know, was the best of them. And that will come up. And we say peace be upon all of them. When we mention the Prophets and Messengers by name or in general, we say, alayhim salatu was salam. May Allah have peace upon or send his peace upon all of them. Um, and he sent them to act as intermediaries between them and their Lord. And what that means is that they were the medium of the message. The prophets and messengers. Without them, there would be no connection. There would be no knowledge, no revelation delivered 
uh, to mankind without the prophets and the messengers. Um, and of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the generous and the bountiful. So by him sending the prophets and messengers, this is from the virtue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows upon his creation. This is the favor of Allah that we are to receive a prophet or a messenger. And so our prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, as is indicated here by the great imam, has certain unique qualities. And so he begins, he says, we are certain that our prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is truly Allah's messenger to all of man and jinn kind. To all of man and jinn kind. So the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was a messenger not only to human beings, all of them, as opposed to one particular group. And there were those that claimed that he was sent only to his own people who were the Quraysh, or if you were to say in general the Arab, there were some from the Jewish community that claimed the Prophet ﷺ was in fact a messenger, but he was sent only to his people, not to our people. Because the Jews, they were waiting for someone to come from Bani Israel. They wanted somebody to come from their particular bloodline. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ came by way of Ismail alayhi So he did have a bloodline that traced to Ibrahim, the father of the prophets. It just was not the same bloodline that the Jewish tribes and community traced themselves back to. So some of them denied the fact that he was sent to them as well. And he was also sent to the jinn. And the jinn, um, of course, we understand as a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ was the only prophet that was sent to them. So a messenger here, and there's a distinction we have to make between a messenger and a prophet. So here we say that uh, our prophet is truly Allah's messenger, which is a rasul We say Rasulullah is a messenger. A messenger is someone who has received revelation, number one, and has been charged to deliver it, number two. Those are the two qualities. They received revelation, and they've been charged to convey it. The Prophet ﷺ is the seal of the prophets, meaning he's the last, the finality, none to follow. And a prophet here, as mentioned, this is Nabi. Nabi, right? A prophet or a Nabi is someone who received revelation but was not charged to convey it. It's been reported that there were 124,000 prophets. 124,000 prophets. This is a hadith that mentions this number. And from them, there were 313, 314 messengers. So basically, if you were to say um, the combination of prophets and messengers, every messenger is a prophet because they have that commonality of receiving revelation. But not every prophet is a messenger because the prophets were not charged to deliver or convey their message, whereas the messengers, they were. And so these numbers, 124,000 prophets, 313, 314 messengers, um, it's probably best not to rely upon the number due to the um, grade of the hadith that's reported. We must, however, believe that our prophet, والسلام, without a doubt, was the best of them, was the best of all of them, if it was 124,000 or whatever number it may be, our Prophet was the best. The great Imam Ibn Aqil, he mentions here to kind of illustrate this point. He says that the Kaaba is more virtuous than the Prophet's grave where he was buried. But, meaning we're talking about the dirt and the soil, the place itself, he says, but if we were to count his grave along with him inside of it, Neither the throne, the carriers of the throne, and the paradise altogether would be more virtuous because it contains a body which, if weighed, would tilt the scale. Meaning the body of the Prophet ﷺ. In comparison to the other creation, to other creation, the Prophet ﷺ is more virtuous and better. Also mentions here uh, that we believe that to him, alone belongs the praised station, al-maqam al-mahmud, which is basically, we talked about this, essentially it is the intercession. And that he was not a follower of his people's religion before the mission, 
This is basically before he was charged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a prophet and messenger, but he was born as a believing Muslim. And this was before the mission even. And basically the Prophet ﷺ worshipped Allah based on the previous legislations. Right? There are legislations that came before. The other prophets and messengers that had a tradition that they delivered and taught, the Prophet ﷺ worshipped Allah by way of those legislations. And this is according to the authoritative position of the Imam's school, the school of Imam Ahmed. The next section here talks about miracles, the reality of miracles. And we're not talking about um, it was a, it's a green light when you thought it was a red light, that type of a miracle. Or when you pulled your uh, uh, laundry out and you found a $20 bill in the pocket. We're not talking about those types of miracles, though to us they are quite miraculous. Um, your tax return came back better than you expected it to be. Miracle, alhamdulillah. That's not the miracle we're talking about, okay? There's a very specific understanding of what miracles are in our faith. So the Imam says, and that decisive and leg legitimate miracles proving his truthfulness were made manifest to indicate his prophethood in association with his mission work, not in association with a tax return or the laundry or the stoplight. They are inexplicable statements or actions in association, conjunction, and correspondence with prophecy initiated as a challenge. None can produce them, their like, or anything similar. So here the Imam highlights five conditions of a miracle. Number one is that it violates the laws of nature. It is something that violates the laws of nature goes against what, everything that we understand about the way the world works. You know, Allah has set the world in motion in a certain fashion. The expectations are just constant, consistent of how the world responds to things, to stimulus. But a miracle, number one, is it violates those basic laws. Number two, those violations or those miracles are in accordance with and support the message. What does that mean? That means like the Prophet is not going to say, for example, um, by Allah, by Allah's permission, I'm going to make this rock speak. I'm going to make this rock speak. And then the rock speaks and says, he's a liar. That's not in accordance with the mission. Right? The mission would be for the rock to uh, affirm the Prophet's Prophethood or messengership. He wouldn't denounce or deny that. That would not be in accordance with and support of the message. Number three is the, that they occur in correlation with the message. That they occur in correlation along with the message. Number four, they pose a challenge to the opposition in order to gain them as followers. So the word is mu'jiza. That's the word for miracle in Arabic. And it comes from the root word al-ajzu. al ajz is an inability. It's an inability. And so when the Prophet ﷺ would deliver a mu'jiza, it would leave his opposition in the state of al-ajz, incapable, unable. They could not do it themselves. That's number five. No one else could produce anything like them. They could not produce it themselves. And certainly, even though they did deny it, it happened right in front of them. The Imam says it's inconceivable that they would appear from a false prophet. It's inconceivable, it's unimaginable, it's unacceptable, it's not legally permissible that a false prophet produce an actual miracle. Something that meets these five conditions. He goes on and he says, we know that he وسلم, was afraid of Allah's punishment before Allah secured him from it, and that he feared his blame and admonition after that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala secured the Prophet والسلام, from punishment in the year after. And after he was secured, the Prophet والسلام, still was worried about Allah's blame or his reproach. Um, and that the foundations of his legislation, the legislation of Allah, and all the essentials contained therein have been transmitted to us by way of him by way of the Prophet with full certainty and that he is infallible regarding what he conveyed for Allah, the glorified, and he is 
as he is from every sin, like all the other prophets, peace be upon them. So here we're talking about something very important for the faithful, especially when it comes to the validity of our message or the perfect nature of our message, the Quran, and also um, what is essential from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That all of that has been reported to us, everything that we need, the complete Quran and uh, as a whole, the complete corpus, if you will, of the hadith has been reported to us, transmitted to us by way of the Prophet ﷺ with full certainty. So the infallibility of the prophets, all of them, is in them intentionally doing anything that would detract from their truthfulness as was proven by the miracle they produced. What does that mean? Basically, such as the conveyance or the message, meaning their delivery of the message or in the message itself. They would not intentionally, and this also includes, they would not accidentally or forgetfully do anything that would detract from that. Whether they did it on it intentionally, purposefully, accidentally, or forgetfully, that they would undermine the miracle. And the miracle here we're talking about is the message from Allah. Or they would undermine the miracle of them being charged to deliver it perfect and completely. They wouldn't make an error. They wouldn't make a mistake. They wouldn't leave something out. It wouldn't be forgotten if it was supposed to be conveyed, etc. So this is the infallibility of the prophets when it comes to those types of miracles. It also includes that which would not detract from their truthfulness as was proven by a miracle or by the miracle, for example, that the Quran, etc. So now we're talking about other things besides a mistake in the delivery or a mistake in the message. We're talking about sin, basically. And there's two types, you know, there's major sin and there's minor sin. Um, and so here, you know, there's some details to this, which hopefully we'll get into at a later date. However, in general, um, the prophets and messengers were infallible from intentionally performing major sins, from committing major sins. And then there's some debate among the scholars, even among this particular madhab, as to whether um, they could fall into such things accidentally the major sins or fall into minor sins. And we'll talk about the details later, inshallah. He says, no one else is infallible. Okay, that's also important to make note of. It's the prophets and messengers that are infallible. No one else, not even the wali. And awliya illah from the saints, the saintly types, the, 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 the pious, devout worshipers of Allah, not even they are infallible. Meaning, they can commit sin. Intentionally so. Make mistakes, err, etc. That's not the definition of a wali. The definition of a wali is something else. And that's not an infallible person. The infallibility is restricted to the prophets and messengers. He says, Contradictions between the prophets, one to the other, regarding Allah's attributes or oneness, etc., are unimaginable, inconceivable that a prophet would contradict another prophet when it came to Allah. Because all of the prophets and messengers believed and were their revelation was received from Allah. There wasn't some other belief system that was introduced to human beings. Divinely introduced, I should say. Okay, there's not going to be a prophet that's going to come and preach um, idolatry. There's not going to be a prophet or a messenger that's going to come and spread the message of um, paganism or atheism or any other ism. Only monotheism. Only that Allah is one. There's not going to come a prophet or a messenger that's going to redefine or recategorize or characterize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in some different way. Their legislation may be different. How they did things, what was halal, what was haram. Those things you'll find discrepancy from one to the next. However, the doctrine, the creed, is always the same. Lastly, we concluded, he says, whoever the Prophet wasallam attested to being in either paradise or hell is as he said.